Okay, good morning. I'm Nancy Davenport. I'm the university librarian at American University and I'm delighted to welcome you to this week's edition of Exploring Social Justice. This series was started in 2014 by the library and it's co-sponsored by the Center for Diversity and Inclusion and for the K Spiritual Life Center on campus. And the series brings to campus exemplary leaders from diverse backgrounds who are advocates for human rights and social justice issues. Today, we have somebody from campus who will be talking with us. There's a full list of speakers for our future pro pro programs on the library's event page and registration links are there as well. There will be one speaker per week through the week of November 7, and then we will pick up again for the spring semester. Um, during the talk, please submit your questions using chat. One of my jobs is to accumulate them all and at the end I'll be posing some of them specifically to our speaker and but we'll also open the microphones then for you to be able to do that. Your mics have been muted for the program but at the end you will be able to unmute them. Um, there is also a link in the chat box for closed captioning if you want that please turn it on. And now let me introduce our speaker. Today we have Professor Lily Wong, Associate Professor in the Departments of Literature and Critical Race, Gender and Culture Studies at American University. And the title of her talk is Sex Work, Media Networks and Trans-Pacific Histories of Affect. Professor Wong's research focuses on the politics of affect slash emotion gender slash sexuality, racial capitalism, minority transnational solidarity movements, as well as media formations of trans-Pacific Chinese, Sinophone, and Asian American constituencies, or communities, sorry. Constituencies is probably because the election's coming and those words are very much in almost everybody's brain. Professor Wong is the author of Trans-Pacific Attachments, Sex Work, Media Networks, and Effective Histories of Chineseness. She received her BA in English from National Central University of Taiwan, MA and PhD in Comparative Literature from the University of California, Santa Barbara. So with that, Professor Wong, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nancy, for the wonderful introduction. And thank you all, all the folks here that made this talk possible. It's always a delight to be able to share your work with folks you work with, um, your campus community and beyond. So I'm very, very um, uh, humbled to be here. Thank you all. Um, like what Nancy said, I'm Lily Wong. I'm housed here at AU in both the literature department and the critical race, gender and culture departments. Um, as you can see on the slide, uh, there's my information, my email, and also my Twitter handle. So for folks that want to live tweet this or and or for folks that just want to give me feedback afterwards, please do. Uh, I love hearing from y'all. So the title of my talk today is Sex Work, Media Networks, and Trans-Pacific Histories of Affect. And it comes out of my book, Trans-Pacific Attachments, uh, the book that Nancy mentioned, um, in which I think through issues of social formation, cultural identity, and sexual citizenship with a focus on the figure of the sex worker in trans-Pacific literature and media. Now by trans-Pacific, I examine trans cultural productions that circulate specifically between uh, the US, China, and Sinophone regions, so Sinitic language speaking regions and nations such as Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, the borderlands, um, and, and Tibet, so on and so forth. Now, the Trans-Pacific scope then allows me to create critical pathways across more established frameworks of analysis, such as nation, ethnicity, language, which can often be exclusionary for folks who are not housed comfortably in them, such as refugees, migrant workers, undocumented folks, sex workers. And so a trans-Pacific scope stresses the linkages and movements produced when say national, ethnic and linguistic particulars are put into contact. So for instance, the book reads the recoding of so-called Chineseness 
as a particularly charged contact zone within Trans-Pacific ideological networks. With a Trans-Pacific framework, our attention then moves away from the authenticity of national or cultural origins, since currents are produced collectively and through the process of contact. So it, it emphasizes relationality, basically. So the book studies not necessarily the truth value of Chineseness or originating in any particular lo location, be it the US, China, or Sinophone regions, but the affective impact or the cross currents, so to say, created by these intersecting conceptions of Chinese character, focusing specifically on the so-called Chinese sex worker as a trans-Pacific scope. So as you see here in my slide, I'm asking the very first and perhaps the most important question to start off the talk, why focus on the Chinese sex worker when the project is to think about these larger issues about social formation and trans-Pacific cultural formation, right? Um, and so something I want to kind of, uh, kind of lay the ground for is that I'm not talking about Chinese sex workers in, in particularly tied to mainland China, but actually a figure that then circulates trans-Pacifically. And if we think about that in a larger context, then we see the history of it uh, long operating as a trope for both Asian American sexuality and Asian modernity. And so in a way, the figure constitutes a pitiful reflection, a pivotal reflection on the link between not only sexual, cultural, and class marginality, but also between Asia and the Americas. So for instance, in the United States, the management of Asian migration through laws such as the Page Act of 1875 reads Chinese working class female immigrants as all sex workers unless proven otherwise thereby banning all working class Chinese female immigrants from entering into the US borders under the name of anti-trafficking. So whenever I teach this in my classes, I always ask my students, how could we ever, how could we have ever thought that a whole demographic of women were of one occupation and that that occupation is sex work? And how is that even logical? And how did that itself last for decades, over a half century? Um, and this is where I push us to start thinking about its impact, right? What does such legal measures do, right? What is the impact of these assumptions that then harden into legal structure? Well, it rationalizes the barring of generations of Chinese female immigrants, which created a gender imbalance, and by extension prevented the settling down of Chinese working class nuclear families in the US for over seven decades. In such a legal framework, Prostitution was positioned as a uniquely Chinese problem that was tied to age old feudalism and Confucian patriarchy. And so the legalized policing of Chinese female bodies worked to justify anti-Chinese exclusion laws, yellow peril discourse, and the civilizing rescue narratives of imperial expansion at the turn of the 20th century. So in other words, it does double work. A, it justifies domestic race-based exclusion, and B, it legitimizes and gives moral logic to US's imperial expansion abroad, specifically into the Asia Pacific at this moment. Now, a good example of this double logic is perhaps uh, this political cartoon, Well Up on Chinese Subjects, which appeared on the San Francisco Weekly in the early 1900s. <clears throat> Here we see the supersized Uncle Sam rescuing Chinese women from the Chinese male coolie who is trafficking them into the America, into the Americas, uh, specifically the US, through the San Francisco Bay. I'm not sure if you could see the caption clearly, but it reads, quote, with his oriental experience so extensive, Uncle Sam should have no problem to handle the local slavery problem, end quote. So such representations of Chinese female immigrants as helpless, unfree sex slaves that need to be saved by a more democratic or benevolent force, in this case, Uncle Sam, works to resolve the paradox ten paradoxical tension between the US's domestic Chinese exclusion, which A, frames the Chinese coolie figure as immoral, feudal, and oppressive to their own women, and B, then uses this orientalist 
racialization to justify the US's empire's civilizational expansion into Asia during this time. So make note, this is the same time that the US colonized the Philippines, annexed the Hawaiian Islands, and was going into Japan, China, and the Asia Pacific more broadly. Now this leads me to the larger, uh, this leads me into thinking about how it's connected then to larger exclusionary measures, most famously the Chinese Exclusion Act that started in 1882 and went on um, and didn't get lifted until more than half a century later in 1943 when the US needed China as an ally to fight uh, World War II. So even with the repeal of Chinese exclusion laws during the mid 20th century, the figure of the Chinese sex worker didn't just die away. Along with the rise of second and third wave feminism, global interest in Asian sex work reemerged during the Cold War as attention was turned towards so-called women of color and third world feminism, um, as we could see through the now canonical books such as Gail Hershatter's Dangerous Pleasures and Sue Groenwood's Beautiful Merchandise. Now, contingent to academic interest in Asian sex work is the way discourses on sex work rights in post-colonial regions such as South Korea, Hong Kong, and Taiwan have been central in mobilizing social movements that probe issues about imperialism, militarization, labor rights, and globalization. And so full disclosure, why I got into this research was because my parents were academics and labor rights advocates who organized alongside uh, sex worker activists at the collective called Cosmos or Zhizhichun at the height of the labor rights movement in Taiwan in the 1990s. And so my book started off as an attempt to extend or contextualize the labor rights work that I witnessed um, growing up and, and which I really admired. Um, but also trying to connect that with kind of a cultural perspective as well, uh, connecting the, the material with the metaphorical, so to say, connecting to the symbolic and discursive work also of sex work through trans-Pacific circulation of text. So now as the figure of the Chinese sex worker, as we now know, has itself a history of mobilizing analysis of both Asian and American modernity, labor and state governance, I read the figure as a certain affective laborer. So here I want to pause a little bit to explain exactly what I mean by affect. So it's not everything and nothing at the same time. <laughs> so to be very clear, uh, I define affect or I read affect in this book as a politics of emotional mobilization. Now affect scholars have long had this debate about the relationship between affect and emotions. Are they the same? Are they different? Does one come before the other? Does one have more radical impact than the other? Um, I detail this debate quite a bit in the book, um, but just kind of a sum up of uh, the most common kind of conversation is that the common distinction is that affect uh, is so-called kind of the dynamism created between bodies that mobilize outside of social structures. So if we were in a physical room here, a good example I would use is sensing the room, right? That the, sensing the room where I can't really put language to what I feel in this moment um, and the, the dynamism I'm creating through bodies. In this case, maybe the dynamism I'm creating through screens with y'all <laughs> that I can't see. Um, so how affect and circulates that way. And then in contrast, emotions would then be uh, expressions that often operate within social structures. So, so ways in which we understand our feelings that are already socially learned that have a language to it, like happiness, anger, and sadness. I'm happy to talk more about this during the Q&A if folks are interested, but here I just wanna be very clear about how I'm using affect. Um, so I'm building off of a very particular genealogy of post-colonial and women of color scholarship that sees affect and emotions as not necessarily different or distinct, but rather intricately tied processes that are not outside of social constructions of say race, sex, gender formation, but in fact mobilizes in relationship to it. So I read performance of performances of affect and emotion as not just private expressions, but as public practices 
that has the potential to reorder our individual relationship to the social. So in other words, I study not necessarily uh, what affect or emotions are, but what they do, right? The sociality of emotions. What I'm looking at is not necessarily affect and emotion as private or psychological or universal states, but as historically specific social cultural practices that are tied to material conditions and have material consequences. So here I'm not reinventing the wheel. I, I'm building off of uh, wonderful theorists like Sarah Ahmed, Lily Xie, Haiyan Li, Claire Hemings, just to name a few. And so to read the Asian sex worker as an affective labor of history, I approached the figure as a cultural medium that historically allows for various collective feelings, so to say, to not only take shape, but also constantly be reshaped. And so to trace the very reshaping, the book thus moves chronologically and covers a considerable amount of time and space so it can trace how these affective structures and relationships move. Um, it focuses on three particular historical intervals, historical moments where world divisions were being drastically reimagined. We start off with uh, the two world system, imperialism, anti-imperialism developed during the early 20th century. Then we move on to the three world system, the first, second, and third worlds, privileged during the Cold War. And then we end with the current moment, which uh, some folks call globalization and other folks call neoliberalism, um, emphasized in the turn of the 21st century ongoing till today. So an example, for as an example, today's talk uh, focuses on one particular uh, chapter, which is my chapter four, um, which focuses on the tail end of the Cold War. The chapter discusses Taiwanese writer Wang Zhenghe's 1983 novel, Rose Rose I Love You, published during the Vietnam War. Now, Rose Rose I Love You Rose Rose I Love You is one of the first Taiwanese novels translated into English and it remains one of the most widely read pieces of Taiwanese literature in English today. Much of Cold War era Taiwanese literature uses the metaphor of Taiwan as prostitute to depict the island's complicated colonial history and its exploited relationship with Japanese colonialism from the past a rising Chinese empire and larger US imperial influences. In Rose Rose I Love You, Wang also alludes to the trope of Taiwan as prostitute, but alters its affective connotations. While his predecessors commonly depict the sex worker as the embodiment of loss and subjugation, thus rallying points to articulate nationalistic sentiments, Wang's sex workers actually ridicule discourses of na national sovereignty altogether. In the novel, the sex workers are the ones who talk back to governing officials and, the use, and, and use a broad range of unauthorized languages, such as unofficial dialects, curse words, and in, in, inscrutable grunts, expressing an affective structure that rejects clear analogies of both a reproductive Chinese motherland and or an independent nativist Taiwanese state. And such, I argue that the sex workers under Wang's pen moves both spatially and affectually. In other words, in analyzing Wang's novel, I shift from previous scholarship, which has focused more on place-bound theorizations, which imply frameworks of territory, locality, and nationality, to then an affective analysis, which emphasizes what is seen as emergent, relational, and networked. And I want to be here, uh, clear here that I'm not trying to discard or cut off really important geopolitical work, right? Work that looks at territory, looks at locality, looks at nationality. Those are all very important work. What I'm saying is to hold on to that, but then let's kind of put that into motion, right? Do we see a broader scope here? Does these conceptions and these structures move in different directions? How do we put that into motion? What are the un unexpected that we can trace? So I'm assuming that most of you here have not read the novel. Don't worry, I got you. I've got a brief intro. 
So Rosos I Love You is a satirical novel set during the Vietnam War. It details one day of the life of a Taiwanese coastal city, Hualien, as its residents receive word that 300 American GIs might soon arrive for a weekend of r and rest and recreation. In response, the town's English teacher, Dong Su Wen, quickly organizes local politicians, intellectuals, and brothel owners to set up a bar complete with local sex workers trained to entertain the dollar-laden US troops. Now, while the whole novel seems to be about the English teacher's preparations for what he calls so-called bar girl diplomacy, the sex worker's apathetic and at times even defiant reactions to his arrangements call into question the very value of the novel's very gist. In other words, the plot actually might not be key here. There's really no plot. <laughs> In fact, the story ends before we even find out whether or not the American GIs even arrive. So it would seem that instead of looking at plot development, what is emphasized is rather the translational politics involved in Wang's very crafting of the novel. Um, and I look specifically at his utilization and crafting of language. This is uh, where we can see this through the English teacher, um, the English teacher's attempt to give the sex workers English names. Um, this is the scene that I'm talking about here. Here, Dong Su Wen is trying to give the sex workers English names and tries to teach them how to pronounce it. <clears throat> now, repeat after me. My name is Patricia. Nothing. Speak. Nah. As her face crimson, student Lee seemed to be calling for her mother before her voice gave out. Ma, ma, mane. Here, student Lee's struggle to articulate the very first word of the English self introduction is reflected within the narrator's depiction of affect, actually. As you could see in red, being peppered with silent nothings, ellipses, and fragmented dashes here. And this actually goes on for nine full pages. So finally, after pages and pages of stutter and silence, snot and tears, the sex worker, Soon Lee, eventually pieces together a string of words. Quote, she forced herself to raise her tear streak face. Her lips quivered until she finally managed to do as she was told. Mani yishi ba. She chewed on her lip and whimpered for a moment. It sounded to everyone as if she had said, Badekishia. Mane yishi shi badekishia. She done it. She said the whole thing. Suwon was beside himself with joy. So as you can see in the scene here, uh, we hear the coexistence of separate yet intersecting narratives. We detect, for instance, marked in black, narratives which celebrate the English teacher's successful instruction of so-called bar girl English. But yet marked in blue, we also hear competing sentiments or affective elements announced through depictions of Soon Lee's tears of embarrassment and fear. And finally, as seen in red, we hear sounds of disobedience through Soon Lee's so-called English rendition of the name Patricia, which retains the sound of her cursing, I'll give you hell and beat you to death. If heard in a combination of Mandarin Chinese and Taiwanese dialect. Now these narratives are allowed to coexist and mediate and at moments even remain incommensurable to each other in terms of meaning and untranslatable in terms of sound. For as the narrator recollects a cacophony of discourses, dominant and minor, ideological and affective, he reconstrues a fable of Taiwan nation building, which deconstructs power relations between languages and articulates Taiwanese national identity in face of US involvement. The story closes with the popular song, Rose Rose, I Love You, which is also the title of the novel. 
While the sex workers were taking a lesson about the popular venereal disease, Shang Saigon Rose, the English teacher had a stroke of genius. He thought they should sing a song, Rose, Rose, I Love You, to welcome the American GIs. As a tune that has already both English and Mandarin versions, it was in the English teacher's mind the perfect song to sing to welcome the American GIs. In fact, the song's lyrics arguably echo the novel's satirical gist. The sweet and charming roses here allude to both the sex workers that are going to sing about them and arguably the sexual love that they are to market and allure their parents to quote, wound their tender stems and precious bud. To push this reading further into the realm of the oral, we can see that the Mandarin pronunciation for rose, mei gui, sounds eerily similar to that of America, mei guo, especially if sung out loud. Mei gui yo mei gui, mei guo yo mei guo. Moreover, the translation of Saigon, as in Saigon Rose, the venereal disease they were learning about, Qigong, in Mandarin looks and sounds identical to the Mandarin term of Western tribute, Qigong. This adds on a layer of satirical meaning to this tale. For as Josh Kuhn argues, music is never completely detached from politics or the history of it. And so I'd go on to stress that what amplifies the politics attached to both the history and the study of musical circulation in this case is the way it moves. With attention to both the spatial and affective dimensions of the term. And so in the final stretch of this talk, I'll focus on tracing tr a trans-Pacific genealogy of this very song, Rose Rose I Love You. Uh, a movement. Now the song emerged into popularity when performed by Shanghai actress Zhou Shen in 1941. Sung by the noted sing-song girl and further popularized through China's mainstream commercial cinema, as opposed to the left-wing revolutionary cinema of the time, Rose Rose I Love You was one of the many tunes dismissed as so-called yellow music. As Andrew Jones explains, so-called yellow music was regarded by both the nationalist government and left-wing intellectuals as a decadent sound. To them, it promoted political passivity and seduced citizens away from unified sentiments of national, national nation building and anti-imperial resistance. Indeed, after the communist takeover in 1949, so-called yellow music like Rose Rose I Love You was then banned from mainland China only to reemerge in different forms across geopolitical borders. Rose Rose I Love You's English version, for instance, was released by Columbia Records in the US in 1951. Written by British radio presenter, Wilfred Thomas and sung by American singer, Frankie Lane, this English version of the same tune Told a fairly different story. May gui yo may gui for my eastern rose. Men crowd in dozens everywhere she goes. In her rickshaw on the street and in a cabaret. Please make way for rose. You can hear them say, All my life I shall remember Oriental music and you in my arms. Perfume flowers in your tresses, lotus scented breezes and swaying palms. Rose, rose, I leave you, my ship is in the bay. Kiss me farewell now, there's nothing to say. East is east and west is west, our worlds are far apart. I must leave you now, but I leave my heart. Circulated shortly after World War II came to an end, the song transforms into a swan song sung by Western, a Western soldier as he bids his so-called Eastern Rose farewell. Through the song's translation or rather transmutation, one can detect what Andrew Jones calls a curious double, a curious double of yellow music. Uh, 
in which yellow signifies both pornography and racial identity, eroticism, and Chineseness. What is excessively emphasized is essentialized, culturally marked difference. The Oriental in front of the music, the Eastern in front of the rose, emphasis which was absent in the tune's Mandarin antecedents. From this post-war English rendition of the song, we can hear tones of Asia's colonial history from which Orientalist imaginations of the East spurred. We can also detect an intimate account of Western military involvement in Asia through the two world wars. In the context of Wang's novel, the song's narrative of an ill-fated East-West encounter works also as an analogy, not only of the Vietnam War at large, but also Taiwan's expulsion from the UN in 1972 and its broken affairs with the US in 1978, during which Wang's story is set. However, Many have argued that the most immediate source of Wang's inspiration for using the song in his novel is the Hong Kong filmic remakes of the Shanghai oldies and the films Hong Mei Gui and Long Xiang Feng Wu. As Taiwanese musicologist He Dong Hong argues, Mandarin Chinese music was, during the Cold War, what the Taiwanese Nationalist Party promoted in order to carry out a de-Japanization through Mandarin-speaking movements. Mandarin oldies, such as Rojo's I Love You, were redeemed from its so-called yellow past to now be recorded as so, quote, clean and healthy medium to articulate what He Dong Hong calls a nationalist structure of feeling. Or in other words, a state-regulated Taiwanese feeling of unified yet entertaining anti-Japanese and anti-communist sentiments. Here, the Cold War circulation of Rojo's I Love You is attached to the nationalist project of Taiwan nation building. Its Mandarin version was propagated to fuel anti-Japanese and pro-Mandarin sentiments. Its English version was, as depicted in Wang's novel, performed to solicit lucrative so-called intimate relations with the US. And so to conclude my talk here, Rojo's I Love You's translingual mutations of trans-Pacific travels complicate the supposedly univocal calls for genetic or political authenticity. I stress that it is precisely through these movements that the tune is able to create spaces in which discourses of national and cultural nativity in Wang's novel gets contested. Released in 1983, Wang's novel comes out at a historical juncture at which Cold War divisions were on the verge of collapse and neoliberal renditions of global connectivity was on the rise. Seen in this context then, I argue, that Wang's Rojo's I Love You, both novel and the use of song, heralds a so-called minor transnational note, which offends unifying choruses of global connectivity while not evoking dominant rhetorics of cultural or national authenticity. This overlapping focus of the transpacific and the affective offers the language of movement, desire, and becoming that allows us to think more broadly across national, cultural, and linguistic frameworks. It shifts our questions of cultural identity away from centralizing notions of authenticity and homeland discourse, often evoked through place-bound analysis of territory, locality, and nationality, and then rep repositioning it as an emergent and consistently transforming theoretical question, tracing an affective analysis of emergent relational and what is networked. This minor transnational focus on transpacific affect is what leads me into my current project tentatively titled Transpacific Alliances, Sinophonic Crossings of Neoliberal Order, in which I trace minor to minor forms of labor and collaboration in the neoliberal contemporary in which individuated consumption and free market extraction are often privileged. I track cross-racial cultural networks that through creative action further a long and living history of anti-colonial solidarity movements. One of the main questions I've been thinking through in this next project is actually how to take the Pacific and the Trans-Pacific seriously in terms of grappling with issues of decolonization and indigenous struggles in and beyond the Pacific Islands. It's important for us to ask then, how do we trace the converging, but also at times incommensurable movements for social justice across anti-colonial and 
decolonizing mobilizations. So while my first book focuses on representations of sex work in relation to trans-Pacific creations of cultural identity, I hope the work opens up further inquiries about the temporary worlds or collective attachments that we are all in the process of co-creating. Thank you very much. Lily, thank you so much for your, your talk today. It is probably one of the most layered presentations I think I've heard. And, and while I've been inviting people to um, put their questions in chat, I'm going to take the moderator's privilege and ask you a couple first. And then I will invite all of our participants to um, turn off your or turn on your microphones and ask your questions as well. Um, the first question literally comes from the audience and they wanted to know if uh, you would make your slides available, which I assume would mean that they would email you and you would email them back. Is, is that acceptable to you? Absolutely. Please do reach out to me. I'm happy to share the slides. Okay. And then my question is, you have a dual appointment at AU. You're a literature professor, and you're also a professor in critical race, gender studies. How do they influence each other? The, the oh. things that you do, do they, do they influence each other? Do they bridge? Do they intersect? Or do you try to keep them separate? Clearly not in some cases, because you are using literature in this talk, showing us the covers of books that you have um, brought into the analysis. No, absolutely. That's a wonderful question. Um, so yes, I am housed both in literature and critical race, gender, and culture studies. Um, and no, I do not think of them as distinct projects. In fact, I see them as extensions, um, this kind of pulling out the structural elements and scope of impact, right? So if in the, the literature department, um, we, we talk, we look so much and so closely at cultural texts and the potential of looking so closely with cultural texts. Um, the CRGC also expands that into kind of larger questions, specifically as it is kind of pinpointing questions about uh, critical race, gender, and culture, right? So, so the kind of, this goes into kind of the beginning of my talk where a huge part of what I see is the moral impetus of my work, not only in the first book, but also ongoing, is to connect the material and the metaphorical, right? Mm -hmm. So to to, to, to connect the material conditions of the world we're in with the metaphorical potentials of the world we can create. Um, that has been an ongoing effort of mine, which I hope that will kind of itself morph and transform as I start publishing more and more. Um, but that is kind of the moral impetus of it all. And so the fact that I am kind of extended across these two departments does exactly that, right? To, to kind of bridge the material and the metaphorical um, of the world we're in and also the world we can create. Good, thank you. Lily, if you want to take your slides down, then people would be able to see you and you could see Absolutely. people who are asking questions of you. Um, uh, we have a question from Sarah Wilson who can't turn her microphone on because of, of things going on in home and workspace, but she's wondering whether in trans-Pacific scholarship as a field, if you find there's a dominant thread of scholarship that tends to de-emphasize the Pacific, and do you find there's not enough anti-colonial or decolonizing voices within this field? That's an excellent, excellent question. Um, so the Trans-Pacific as a concept or, or a methodology to organize uh, scholarship or, or thinking, right, uh, has been ongoing, but recently has done this upsurge uh, of scholarship that does it. And I do agree that kind of first upsurge of it all does not take the Pacific and, uh, seriously, including my first book, right? I, 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 I could have taken a lot more emphasis uh, to thinking about the Pacific in particular, specifically, let's say, um, the Pacific Islands, or the question about decolonization um, in relationship to the, de the, the anti-colonial efforts that I'm tracing across 
US, China, and Sinophone regions, right? So that it, it kind of brings a depth to the conversation in terms of not only thinking about national sovereignty and independence movements, but also actual decolonization. And, and you are absolutely right that um, a lot of work, including mine, including my first book, should have grappled with that more seriously and uh, more consistently. And so this is part of the impetus for the next book is to kind of rethink the scope and scale of it, right? In a way, not only extending the scope, but also going deeper into questions about land and possession and the possessive individual as it's tied to liberal conceptions of racial capitalism. Um, and so to go deeper, basically, and that is exactly uh, where I think the field is, is moving and where I'm hoping my second book project will go towards. Um, but also just a, another plug, I'm actually working with um, a, around 10 other scholars that are, are kind of trying out this concept of the Trans-Pacific as a methodology to think through exactly what you're talking about, the intersections between anti-colonial struggle and decolonial struggle and to take the Pacific seriously. We're coming out with an anthology soon. Um, right now we're all in kind of the editing phases, but hopefully this anthology will be coming out um, within the next few years. Um, and so that I see as kind of material collaborative efforts to expand the field and to push the conversation uh, towards exactly where you're saying. Uh, other questions? Turn on your microphone. I have a question. I was typing it up, but I'm not sure if I'm going to ask it, um, like how I mean. So maybe if I say it, it'll be easier. Um, I just wanted, I don't really know if this is the right question, uh, but I feel like you would know if you have a, any viewpoint whatsoever on this. Um, do you feel listening to this is why I came to this. Do you think that the idea that sex work is necessarily like below other anything is tied to simply the fact of like cultural differences, like racial discriminatory differences? Or do you think it's tied more to the, to the woman itself? Like the idea of the woman, just because throughout history, I mean, there were, there's white sex work, there's sex work all over the world. It's the oldest job in the world. And I'm just wondering, do you feel it's tied closer to the damning because of the cultural ties or the feminine ties? I hope that makes sense. I'm so sorry if it doesn't. <laughs> no, I, 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 uh, I, I'm hearing your question and um, I'm gonna attempt to answer and let me know if I'm not answering your question. Um, I think it's both, right? And, and I think perhaps the better answer of it would be historical historical ties, right? So um, the ways in which we then value or devalue rather sex work at different historical moments at different particular contexts has everything to do with power, right? Um, and so this goes into uh, the way I started this whole, whole, whole talk about the Page Act of, uh, of the 1800s, right? Um, that itself was a way to protect a national body politic to be majority Anglo-Saxon and white. Um, and also to make sure that we create a transient labor force uh, that will never have the right to own land and property and will not have the right to have legal heterosexual marriage. At that moment, uh, heterosexual marriage was, uh, was the only kind of legitimate form of marriage. Um, and to make sure that you don't have an illegal second generation that has birthright citizenship. <laughs> so this is a good example of how then devaluing certain work along either racial, cultural, or, you know, there's so many other structural elements here, lines, um, is a political project, right? And so, so it's not just, uh, and even the ways we code the feminine or the ways we code class is so different um, in these different historical junctures. So I, I hope I answered your question that instead of it being tied to the feminine or, or the cultural, it's, it's very much about the historical, right? And this can, in this case, even though it's coded as Chinese a problem, it is actually a US imperial problem. It's a way for the US to expand itself into the Asia Pacific. So it's about power. Thank you. That's, I totally answered it. And that's exactly how I felt. I just wanted to see if you had any more insight that I wasn't catching. So thank you so much. Other questions? If not, let me again thank Lily for her talk to us today. Um, and I'm sure you'll be getting emails from uh, participants who want your slides. And then I would like to announce the, um, the next speaker 
the next speaker in this series will be on, and the next presentation will be Thursday, October 29 at 11.30, and it's Kathleen Ballou. Some of you may have heard her on NPR for over the last couple of weeks, because I've been hearing her on Saturdays as I'm driving around with errands. She is, she is an assistant professor of US history at the University of Chicago, and she's going to discuss her book, Bring the War Home, the White Power Movement and Paramilitary America, examining previously classified FBI files and vivid personal testimonies and letters. You can go to the library's event page and register for that program now. Um, and there are a couple of other comments that have come in. Um, I'd encourage you to read, this is from Brianna Dole. I'd encourage you to read up on C. Riley A. Orton's idea on Black trans transivity, which looks at the ways that race and gender perform together historically in a single body. 